Am I still recording? I have fucking, yes, I have fucking good ass levels. Damn, first try. Hell yeah, first try. First try. <laughs> Hi, friends and enemies. Hi. Um, welcome to Hello. to Boat Knife. Boat Knife is an arts and culture podcast where me and my best friend Patrick uh, talk Hi. about media that we t- that we that we send to each other. Um, Hello to Boat Knife besties and worsties alike. <coughs> Today, we're going to be talking about two things. Uh, we're actually going to be talking about. Two things this time, uh, instead of like uh, what we did with the last two episodes, which was talk about one media property over the course of eight hours, I think, something like that. We're still kind of reeling, honestly. I'm still reeling. I haven't thought about anything as long as I've thought about Echo. Yeah, Echo Echo has fucking altered my brain chemistry. Um it's a cognito hazard. It is a, it really it is is. a cognito hazard, but I am recommending it to every single YouTuber <laughs> that I am in contact with. Uh, Today, though, we will be trying our best to talk about two different things. Avery has sent me another three-volume manga series by mail uh, so that I can, ma- I can turn the pages and make the man appear in the box. Um, tell me about Gengaku Picasso. Tell me about all right. Uh, Gengaku, Gengaku Picasso, Picasso is... By uh, Usamaru Fur- Furuya. Uh, it is a harem manga about Leonardo da Vinci. Um, actually, it's about a fucking kid, fucking dweeb, little bastard ass dude um, <laughs> who's really good at drawing and receives... A, a godly gift from the heavens uh, that, that that he becomes suddenly able to perceive people's like trauma and psychological issues as surrealist art pieces that he must then interpret the symbolism of uh i discovered this uh when i was fucking i must have been like 12 uh, the, the first chapter of this ran what was shown in Shonen Jump magazine because I was subscribed to it then. <laughs> uh, Weeb Avery, Weeb Avery was a weird time. I, I, there's a lot of stuff I can talk about from that era, but I see a lot of residual forms of that yeah. today. Like I remember. Like when we first started talking, one of the first things that we really like, one of the first big things was uh, Madoka Magica was one of the first things that was like big connecting point, like that specific kind I mean, of like Madoka Magica hot is fucking good. It's so good. It's it's, it's, it's it too, too good to be real, honestly. Um, but Genkaku Picasso was a very formative media experience. Every time I revisit it, uh. I, I seem to discover, like, a new side of it that I'm now uh, saddled with. Like, like You fucking found what? <laughs> you fu- found the fucking big one this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that, too. Um, yeah. Uh, a- every time I revisit it, like, as I grow into an adult, I discover more parts of myself that are directly lifted from it. It It, it is truly close to me as as far as media pieces go and i have lost the ability to critically ascertain like its actual quality um but it does make me cry every time i reread it uh so that's something and i've got good news for you i didn't have any of the baggage for shit co- <laughs> or shit coming in with this uh, I don't really meet, read manga all that much, and I thought it was pretty cool. It, I thought it was really nice. It's really good. All right. You're not stupid for like yeah yeah. <laughs> let um, let's get uh, let's get into the way that it's framed because for people not familiar with it, a lot of it does kind of fall into like a um. The best I could describe it is like a 
it's like a monster of the week type of thing. It's like there, it has this very rigid format to it. That's like something you would see in like a, like a children's anime or like a, like a, like a modern cartoon or something like that. Like an eighties cartoon. It has this very rigid uh, structure to it, which is like, um, Gengaku Picasso, who is the main character, um, uh, is, his, his name Gengaku is, Picasso. He, his, his name is not Gengaku. It, oh yeah, right. Fuck. What's his name? His name is Hikari. Hikari. His name is Hikari. His name is Hikari, but he misspelled his name on his sh- shoe, so it said Hikaso. So people started calling <laughs> yeah. him Picasso. It's so good. <laughs> so good. So, I I. <laughs> First chap, first I see why this survived for a good amount of time in Shonen Jump, because the first chapter really does have a fucking lot happening in it. Like it's very normal for the first couple of pages, and then a girl does get killed by a helicopter accident. <laughs> yes. Uh, in a big fucking scary illustration. Yeah, you see the um, you see the fucking smoke. Mm-hmm. It yeah. like spends the entire first chapter establishing the this very convoluted set of uh, rules and lore about like how he um would always like be at an art club with this girl that he like liked but couldn't really process the feelings of properly at the lake and then she dies in an accident and he then he starts getting these visions of her as an angel who lives in his pocket and then like she then like they notice that his arm is rotting off uh and that if he doesn't like keep solving people's problems using uh the abilities granted by him but like using the uh by interpreting the weird sketches that he that he's being drawn that he's drawing uh derived from people's subconscious like fears and and desires and shit like uh he would able to rot off his entire body um which is a lot to go on in the first chapter but it really does spend pretty much the rest of the manga just kind of uh, applying that format, working within that format, and then like slowly interrogating the format itself near the end in a way that's really compelling. Uh, um, and and a, a, an important thing to note with this, I I don't know much about the background of this author, um, Usamaru Furuya, but he does have like experience in fine art, which is which is why the the actual sketches that that he discovers. Um, by peering into the to the souls of the troubled youths surrounding him, uh, are actually really cool. Like <laughs> the art in this is so good; it's, it's really good art. It's yeah. like every time he every time I, he sees a he sees a new illustration to draw, and and he draws it. We get a full a full page to just get to look at his sketchbook page. Um, some of them are so fucking sick and weird. Yeah. And it's like they get better as as the manga goes on. Is the thing like they get mm. they get more surprising and striking, and it starts to feel like you said monster of the week. You start to feel like, oh, how are they going to solve this one? When you see the yeah, illustration, yeah, yeah. and it seems very in- inscrutable. Like you, um. It, it it's there's like this heart stopping moment where you where it's like the it's like the big Godzilla dude coming over the shore. Um, it has the same emotional reality as that. Um, <laughs> and and the 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 last one is probably <laughs> like the best fucking use of that. But but uh, we'll we'll get to that part. I'm just yeah yeah we'll get to that later. Um, um I th- yeah it's like. Fuck it. One thing that I do like about the series is like the way that Hikaru is involved within like the pro- like the process of like solving the problems that these people have is like it's often very roundabout in a way that's kind of fun. Like it's very like a lot of the times it'll just be like he gets sucked into the illustration um, and he doesn't even really do all that much outside of just make it like this very visible mind palace. Like a lot of the time he just kind of like watches as the problem solve them, solve themselves and just kind of like tweaks them as they go along. Um, so it is kind of monster in the week, but it's in the sense of just kind of like, it's, it's, it uses the monster of the week format to just kind of, uh, 
take a tour of these tour of these different spaces more than anything else yeah it's 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 a lot more interested in like the the surrealist imagery and the the metaphorical significance of these these mind palaces that he's illustrating than it is like the actual mechanics of the puzzle solving or whatever yeah like it could have fallen into a trap very easily of um having the whole point of all of these illustrations just kind of be just kind of to carry the symbolic weight. Um, and there is kind of something that's that if it was done poorly, it could be kind of icky of just kind of like there being a one-to-one -one symbolic purpose for every single individual element of each illustration being in, in place for these surrealist drawings. But it's definitely coming from a place where the issues that uh, these kids are having um, and the illustrations themselves, like the aesthetic appeal of the illustrations themselves are kind of working in t working in tandem. They were definitely like written in tandem and, for each other. And sometimes like they reveal the significance of the, of the symbolism in a very subtle way that's sort of known to the reader, but not to the characters. Um, I, I can yeah, talk about, yeah. I can talk about a specific chapter now. Uh, yeah, go for in, it. Volume two, which is where I think the story gets gets really good. The first chapter in that is about this dude, this this punk, who is telling people about his new girlfriend, but it turns out that she's not real. She's like a character that he made up from like a blog. Yeah, and, yeah. He was just kind of like stalking this girl on social media and pretending it was his girlfriend. Um. And and his mind palace depicts this like illusory version of her. Um and above her is a Rubik's Cube which which flips and fiddles itself into different like images that he's made, uh of like like screenshots of her of her blog and stuff. And we don't we don't the characters never find out why it's specifically a Rubik's Cube, but then there's just like one panel where you can see like oh he actually just likes those like that <laughs> yeah it's 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 a it's a schema that he likes to use it's just something that makes sense to him yeah uh, there's a lot of characters in this that are autistic as shit um i <laughs> <laughs> like more so that i feel like i'm really not projecting this time uh like it's it's so much fucking odd like he's but he on the cover of the fucking first volume he's biting his thumb and throughout the entire thing, there's these entire scenes of him, like, gnawing on his thumb while having a conversation. And most of it, like, most of, like, let's go back to it as, like, a harem thing for a second. Because you mentioned that as a joke, but I think that's interesting. Uh, that's an interesting way to frame it. Because it is kind of a harem in a way. It's like each of, it's like each of these times, it's like more and more people are entering this guy's orbit. Uh, and becoming part of his life through these misadventures. Um, and, like... Yeah, I don't know, like, like, he has that kind of, like, harem protagonist thing of not being good at social cues and fucking up social interactions a lot, but it's in a way where it's, like, he is, he, it seems like he is more so just, like, having trouble processing information that's presented to him, uh, and having trouble navigating these social situations more so than, like, him just being, like, a nasty little pervert bitch. He is... He does look superficially like he does look and act superficially like a harem pr protagonist, but also yeah, there are specific things about him that make him not very decidedly not a blank slate. Like he's already a very adept artist when the when the story begins, and he has a, a like an obsession with Leonardo da Vinci, uh, and there are a lot of scenes about that where where like you'll see there's a there's a gathering outside at, in the in the ball court and and the guy is just sitting in the corner drawing ants and he's just so deeply like <laughs> like just delighted at the shape of them he's like I their heads are he's monologuing like he's monologuing about ants yeah yeah <laughs> it's he's he's autistic as shit 
um, he is smack cam. Good, good for him. Good for him. Hey, Avery, why'd you, uh, why'd you attach to this character so much when you were really young? And that's so weird. Haha. <laughs> that's such a, that's such a weird thing that happened. Haha. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I do. No, that's another like short thing. That's just like a side thing. Is that like I do like that he's a really good artist separate from these moments where he has these artistic flashes and is able to draw these incredible illustrations. Like he really does practice. Like a lot of the times when they just kind of need him to be doing something, he's practicing like form drawing and drawing hands and shit uh, and experimenting with different styles in this book. Like there's things in the notebook that aren't these things. Um, but he also just does that separately. Like that is separate from his artistic ability, but also is still kind of like a product it's, of it. It's um, it's cool. It's interesting because the superpower the superpower he gets is very foreign to him still, even though he is a very skilled artist. There is a scene near the beginning that pretty explicitly uh, foreshadows most of the story um, when Chiaki, his girlfriend, not girlfriend, before she dies from a helicopter accident. Uh, she, she says to Picasso, like, hey, uh, draw, draw a picture of the inside of my heart. And Picasso says, hmm, I, I cannot, I cannot draw something I can't see. Uh, mm. and, and that's, that's sort of the idea, like both his artistic de development and his, his like character development is built in, into the same arc, uh, because he does, he he learns to draw things that he can't see, um, and also like that, that is, I think it is very interesting that he gets the nickname Picasso, but he he does not like Picasso. Picasso. He likes this classical artist, um, which good for him. Good for him. Uh, but like having that dichotomy between the classical artist and the the famous modernist that a lot of people heard of, because uh... he really only interprets things along like literal lines for his art. There's never a point where he derives symbolic meaning from anything that he's drawing. Even what like even outside of the surrealist things that he's trying to negotiate, there's never a point where he's like. So applying symbolic value to any of the formal sketches he's doing or anything he sees anyone else drawing. Um, he really seems to not give a shit about any of that, um, which is which is interesting within the context of the story, uh, and especially within the context of the ending, uh, which kind of pulls the curtain back on everything with that. Before we get to that, though, um, I wanted to talk about like more specific instances throughout this that were interesting tell, tell to me you. tell me about a chapter you really like that is not the fujoshi chapter or the trans chapter <laughs> <laughs> i like the second one a lot actually i like the second one because it's really really low stakes that's a um the art the art does generally get better as it goes along but outside of the final illustration the second drawing is like definitely my favorite I fucking love that one a lot. The, the, uh, that's the, bunny? the one with the bunny, the bunny, yeah, the bunny rabbit, the one with the bunny rabbit and the big baby. Cause that's like, um, it's something that's so like, it's such like a, the, the issue with that of just like her, of like a, a perceived allergy where their one doesn't actually exist is one that's like, like a really specific trauma. It's a very specific trauma and a trauma that's like, comparably small in scale in comparison to a lot of the rest of the series the, um, the, the significance and like seeing it illustrate yeah the, the, it's the like, significance of of the of the bunny and the baby is that this this girl has a pet that she didn't remember when she was very young that that died and she, and implanted the false memory that that the the rabbit died because it ate vegetables when actually it was like poorly cared for and had bad guidelines and practices. So there's like the set, the, the one element of this thing that's very easy to solve. That's just like this very basic misconception about a thing that happened, this thing that happened to a rabbit. But there's also like the separate layer of just like a long-term thing that her parents lied to her about. Um, 
that isn't doesn't even necessarily take that much processing, but is something that's just kind of like, oh shit, uh, I I need to talk about this with you right now, or I'm or I'm probably not going to be able to process it later. That was really cool. I really like that one a lot. Um, that one stuck out uh, as being one that had when... very like really good execute. Like that's the one the, being like very interesting concept and execution to it that's like my favorite balance with that. as a tween when i read the part when the rabbit turns around and there's a fucking bloody hole in its face Ugh. uh i that was the most metal shit i had read at that point in my it's, life it is fucking sick uh i'm looking at it now it's the 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 mind palace is illustrated in a very formal pencil like art pencil uh style uh because he canonically draws everything with a 2b they 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 have that detail in there um which is it's it's like the medium rare of art pencils uh mm. and and the real world has a very clean manga looking aesthetic which which I think is interesting that the that the the real world looks more artificial than the than the mind palace does because because the mind palace is 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 drawn with with this very shaded textured uh technique um I love I I do love the art like just of the characters they all have lips which yeah yeah that doesn't happen a lot it yeah. took a while for me to pick up on that yeah but they do have lips they have lips and noses and all, some of them have like nose ass noses too it's there, there's like a especially later on the 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 art style is a bit more true to life than you'd expect from a slice of life high school manga but it's not it's not like realistic it's it's it, it has a bit more human texture in it than you'd expect. Uh and it does make the main guy look incredibly femme. Which is yes, like very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Such a he he's he's constantly got like these rendered, like almost not full, but very pronounced lips. And I love I like I I got more into that as a design element the more I looked at it as a kid. Also wanted to give wait before yes. we got into you know. <laughs> okay. I uh, wanted to give a quick wanted to give a quick shout out to uh the one where uh goth girl learns uh the appropriate way to uh a more appropriate relationship to have with uh the goth singer that she likes a lot. That one's uh, that one's great how... because it misleads you a bit. Yeah, it's like it, it seems like it's going to be a thing where there's like an evil fucking like emo like midwest emo musician who's making lyrics about that make this girl want to kill herself intentionally but it's just kind of like towards the end of it um it, it's like it's more so it, it's very explicit about it being an issue of her having pre-existing like suicidal tendencies and like suicidal ideation uh and her using the music as an as a means to kind of exaggerate and fucking perpetuate those like very negative thoughts that she's having instead of like approaching it as a piece of art or approaching it as like some kind of form of catharsis. Um, I did, I did get very fucking emotional at the balloons page. I got really, I, 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 <laughs> I, I gotta say the, the, the yeah. picture of, of, of the, of the MILF with holding all the balloons is might be my favorite uh. of the illustrations. Um, that one's really good. That's such a fucking good illustration. It's so but like good. the balloons, but the balloons being let free. That page specifically is like, that one hit me a lot harder than I was expecting it to, because it did mislead me. I thought it was gonna be dumb for a minute, but then it wasn't. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, they have a good way about it. One thing I will say, uh, as the series went on, um, is that there was less. Uh, of a focus on the immediate illustration and more so on the dream world that it, it was kind of like yeah it the, started the, being treated more as like like an entrance a portal yeah like a painting in mario 64 you're only like, seeing like a little bit of it where as in for, for a bit all of the all of the illustrations in volume one 
contained all of the information and all the symbolism that was needed. Yeah. But uh, I kind of preferred that, honestly. And I'm a little like that's one of the only things where it's I'm a little bit myth that it kind of dev- that it kind of got away from that as it went on. And, and, uh, and I later it would, like, it would be. Yeah, it's like they go into it and then they discover that the castle is actually on a table and they can go out the castle and get big. And then there's another room connected to that room. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's it's it, it the, it's more of like a portal into the universe than it is like all of the information that you need to like unpack that the, it doesn't contain all of the symbols that you need to unpack right out the gate. Yeah, I, I, re- um, I remember thinking about that, um, mm-hmm. especially like the last few, the ones in volume three, like. Yeah, I, that's one of those ones I was like. There, there's no way to tell what the fuck uh, the one that's like the big statue is right out the gate. There's yeah. no way to tell with that. I I, you I don't wish even see the city with that. You don't. You, you don't. Like you don't see. You see the smoke. You don't see the like. They have to go in there and discover all the the Hanaiwa statues. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that that's a bit disappointing. But I do think like the actual writing gets gets better as it goes on. Like the first yeah, volume yeah, yeah, yeah. in the first volume, like I've heard this said and I kind of agree, a lot of the stuff that is talked about is really very cartoonishly specific. Like <laughs> like the first one the 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 first thing is that this this guy wants to fucking commit murder because his dad won't give him funds to go to college and that's like King. <laughs> dang <laughs> and and then the second one this 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 lady has an aversion to vegetables because her pet rabbit died when she was a baby and, i like that a lot though i like the really stupidly specific shit i think that's great um but the the second volume got into more broadly relatable, like teenage mm. angst shit, and like in some of the stuff in there, I have never seen these particular inner worlds depicted with such love and empathy. Like going back to yeah. the to the fake girlfriend guy, it's not it's not just that he's lying; he's he's actually has this image of her that's that's real in his head, and he can't let it go. And he has to like break up with her. Yeah, mind yeah. Knows. Chiaki has to has to become his fake girlfriend and break up with him, and it's and that part <laughs> also may, like gets gets to me because like the it's never treated as like oh this fucking guy he was trying to trick people into thinking he had a cool girlfriend. It's like a real issue for him. But then. Because he's a kid and he's insecure. But then there's the chapter about the fucking Fujoshi, which attacked me <laughs> personally. Uh, yeah, get fucked. Now, it did not when I was young. I didn't really get it when I was young. But um, a, a few things about it <laughs> stuck out to me as an adult. Um, so there's this, there's this fucking goth GF. Um, her name's Atone. Uh, Kotone, um, and, and and her the image of her mind her of her mind palace is this fucking enormous mecha from a mecha anime that that she likes this fictional one called Aran Giran, uh, which I love I love the the main character of that and I and I and I like how the guy draws the art style of that like everyone in it has fucking pointy chins, yeah I, it's. <laughs> It's got the Garo Sangan thing, yeah. Uh, but at at the Mecca's feet is this crystal, and and the crystal is actually like a a giant fortress inside of which uh, the girl keeps her fucking obsession with boy on boy romance. Like she has a, I love she has a yaoi space. Way, <laughs> I love the way that the yaoi is drawn in this. I love the like really subtle shift in art style for the yaoi. In this. Like yeah universe yaoi like all of it all of the colors are really soft like on some pages there's like a replication of like the really shitty gradients that people would be using for these for pictures like this in yeah 2008. yeah the, the one page it has the ev party gradients the, the, yeah. the one the one page where where um the dude i forget his name when when he confronts her about all the 
the Yaoi fan funny. art that he found on her on her blog. Uh, <laughs> Great scene. All man. of the all of the hair on the characters of the fan art they're showing have that fucking circle <laughs> gradient thing. It's so, it's so good. <laughs> uh, Fuck. That's the only page that's like that. Too. Yes. God damn. <laughs> but but then like there's the sequence where where Hikari must be guided by by um by by Dank, the, the main character of, of Arangiran, who who has to help him is, pilot the mech and discovers his name is Dank. Dank. <laughs> his name's Dank. And there's Very good. and it's like they they we under we begin to understand the psychological ra uh, the reality of this Fujoshi where it's actually she was fucking slut shamed as as a tween and yeah. she she's grown to to find girls to be disgusting and like she's been indulging in this like girl free safe space. Uh, These are the only relationships that she can visualize that don't involve women getting hurt. Yeah. So she visualizes them. Uh, and God, like you didn't have to do that to me, sir. No, yeah. It's, like <laughs> it, it cuts to it. They, it, it, it. It's it's like the the. She, it, the, 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 the I'm looking, would not I'm looking work at the at fucking dialogue. I hate it. I'm weird. I can't control myself. <laughs> That's why I like Mecha. It's easier to think of myself as a machine. <laughs> I am interested in boys and kissing, but I think I'm dirty that way. <laughs> like, why'd you have to do that? Um, it's, the series would not work at all if the author didn't have, like, didn't really attempt to interrogate, at least attempt to interrogate why each of these things were happening. If it, if not, all of these topics were approached in bad faith, like the series would crumble immediately. There would be no yeah. Phones to, there would be nothing. So to like what I'm saying is like if 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 Hikari had drawn a picture of my own heart in that moment instead of a giant mecha, there would be an enormous Pomeranian. Um, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> Make. <laughs> God. They made the like fictional mech uh, protagonist like he did a good job of designing the boys too. Like this looks like a mecha protagonist. It does. I can imagine a he has, full series. He has, a, with he has a fucking star on his cheek. He has he has a fucking sharing god. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> uh okay. Let's get into the meat of it. Let's get into a the the one that let, chapter. The, yeah. Um, let's get let's get let's get into the epic chapter. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, you go. Yeah, this, yeah, this manga, go. this manga features my, my first ever exposure with a trans character, uh, in fiction. Um, there is this one, like, kind of fruity looking dude who stops by, yeah. like, Picasso's class. <laughs> um, his name is Yosuke. And they they kind of they kind of like confuse you from the very beginning because because he looks like a girl already when you first meet him and it's there's like a bit of confusion when when people use he uh, but then suddenly uh, inspiration strikes and, and Picasso draws a picture of a okay this is my favorite illustration in the book the fucking the fucking female knight standing up against an endless horde of 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 knights and and the knight the female knight has a fucking skirt um <laughs> and then the, and then they they discover as they enter the mind palace that the, the female knight is yosuke and Whoa. and, and 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 she has she has uh envisioned herself as fucking Joan of Arc and and goals like god <laughs> like it's like so she show so she prefers the name Jean um or is it Jean or Jean I think it's Jean uh i 
it's 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 I think it's Jean. I'm just gonna do Jean because it's fucking Jean. French. Oh, you uh, okay? So Jean <laughs> or 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 Joan, if if you're going with the with the actual like like the reference. I'll that just go makes. for. I'll just go for. I'll I'll just do Joan. Lots of. I guess, I guess we could get into that too. Lots of situation. The situation with like preferred name and pronouns and everything is very wonky with her in a way that doesn't really feel like negligent or antagonistic it just kind of feels like something that's yeah like a I, th- very I think that i think i think there it's was a very a, 2008 way of approaching the topic i think there um, was there must have been a tra- like a translation bug because the i'd be interested in uh hearing if, if anyone's familiar with this and knows about the original like the pronoun situation the original translation with this i'd be very interested be, in because the the like, the the text surrounding this chapter does not seem to realize that she's trans um yeah. which, which which is weird the the book does not because everything else does yeah because, because it's not just that that she envisions herself as Joan to Arc uh is she she fucking opens a a pop-up book and says let me tell you the story of my people and we get it's just a very candid portrayal of gender dysphoria at, and and how it affected her childhood. Um, and then we get to her bio in the third book in the blurb at the start. Her blurb in the bio is, quote, Born with a boy's body, but a girl inside. His classmates accept that and call him GN. So I don't know... It's it's like, like it's like Birdo. Okay, no, no, like, it, it's like it's it, just... it is it is like Birdo. And 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 the, and the thing is that she doesn't even really seem to mind it that much. Like she seems to be fine with it, which I think honestly it might not be a thing with translation, and that might just be a thing they're okay with. Because I have seen other like, okay, so I obviously I'm entering territory that I don't fucking know that too too much about here, but I have seen like. Japanese media in the past um, that includes people that would ostensibly from like this the 80s and 90s um, and like 70s and shit um, that contains people that would ostensibly be considered trans women um, and are like treated as women throughout the entire text but still use like he him pronouns throughout the entire duration i need to show you funeral parade of roses like, at some point actually the thing is that shit's like i yeah. i truly <laughs> don't know if they had fucking said the word transgender somewhere in there would i have figured this shit out early like w- yeah. would i have yeah would i have gotten it because <laughs> like it is it is like a weird weird thing of like she is ostensibly a trans woman woman um but it's very much so this scenario where like all of her all of her classmates just kind of like one one thing that's weird all of her classmates are very supportive of her and like her a lot and are very supportive of her transition and shit but still continue to like misgender her generally and but she's also seems to be fine with it um no, we don't. It's we don't. Weird. We don't see it's it. We, we see it happen behind her back. We don't actually see her reaction to it. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Should they let her work at the little fucking maid cafe they have later? Yeah, and everyone's like, "Wow, GN's so cute. I wish I was as cute as him." And I'm like, "Huh." <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, that that's it's it's it's. I'd like to hear about the translation of that. Yeah, because I I I'd I, like to know if that is a translation thing or if it is like a I want specific deeper thing. I, I want to believe. About, uh, I want to believe that that it is that that it is a translation bug because they do they don't they don't say trans but they do fucking say gender identity disorder. Like, they do, uh, they do, which is which caught me off guard because this is from like two thousand eight or like the translations from twenty twelve too or something. Yeah, and I and I don't know maybe twenty ten. <laughs> yeah. God. Um. Was this before transphobic tech? Now hold on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, transphobic techno was 2011 damn bitch got a penis yeah it was <laughs> <laughs> that did it did not okay fun fact it did not 
it was not called transphobic techno when it was originally uploaded. It was called bitch got I've... a penis. It... I feel like it's tra- I feel like it was called transphobic techno the whole time though. I can't find any records of it not being called transphobic techno. Okay. Like we'll leave that the fa- for the like... historians. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, but like just like the concept of Ray William Johnson knowing what the word transphobic was in 2011 before it was being comic commonly used in academic papers is like fucking weird. It's <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to be left to the historians, but um I don't want to give the impression that this is like that Gian's portrayal within Gengaku Picasso is like negative by any capacity because it's like it really is like a very sweet thing. It's really sweet. It's yeah. something that could have been very like fucking mean it, and wasn't. It's it's um, it's not even like it doesn't even have it be about like body dysphoria. She has yeah. like very It's very because ex- she is cultural. hot the whole time. It's cultural. She knows she's hot the whole time. It's the it's, it's it's like like she she likes girl things, which is a part of is which is a part of gender dysphoria, which I think people are afraid to talk about because it feels really trivial and <clears> like <throat> arbitrary. But but no, like gender dysphoria can manifest as taking an interest in things that you think you shouldn't be. Uh, yeah. Even if even if that thing is completely arbitrary and culturally made, the connection. Like you might, you might fucking be trans just because you like Barbie. I, I'm sorry to say, it might just be that. You might. Like, you might. I, Who gives a shit? Yeah. <laughs> um, and and of course, a lot of people take that and say like, oh, you think fucking everyone who's feminine in any capacity or likes girly things has to fucking <laughs> explore their their peen. Um, I'll have you know that I'm a brony and I'm a manly man. <laughs> Look at me, I'm a military brony. I'm a, f- <laughs> I'm a military brony. God. <laughs> there was so much of that shit. That was one of the first things that, like, the thing of, like, bronies posting about how buff and manly they were and how much they weren't girls despite watching My Little Pony. That was, like, a, that was a seed that was planted very young of, like, huh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, it's, like... It's never, it's, there's also, like, really specific things that feel very lived, even though I'm assuming they were. Like, the, pro, like, the, even just the framing of, like, everyone thinking that Jian is, like, a, that, that Jian, like, trying to integrate into, like, women's spaces <coughs> and trying to, be, bless you. Like, there's a very early sequence in this chapter that's, like, the, the, the inciting incident, the fucking inc- yeah, yeah, the yeah. inciting incident is is her wanting to go into a, a woman's bathroom. Like it's it's very and, the, and, learned. and all of the girls in her class saying that she's a pervert and is trying to invade on their spaces. And it's, it's like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> what? Where did you read? What? What did you read about? Who? Who do you know? Oh, who told you about uh, this? Uh, he had to have had like a friend or something. yeah, yeah, like some it's, shit it's, like it's that. It's too. It's too specific. Another good change that i think happens in volume two is that they no longer act like picasso has won and done fixed their problems like their fucking trauma uh Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. like the wow i'm cured my my allergy is cured because uh we start getting like pictures after like the solved version of of their heart photograph uh and 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 this this trans girl's one is like her now without her armor waving a flag of victory but there are dark dark storm clouds in the background and 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 someone so and, and, one, and one of them notes like her battle will probably continue like <laughs> <laughs> as, so <laughs> fucking sick <laughs> it's so sick um is there anything else you wanted to get to before we made the plunge into volume three yeah, nah, Jan's the, the, the Jan's the big one. I love her dearly. I'm happy that she got to work in the maid cafe yeah. and that everyone thought that her dress was cute. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I love her. I, I, <laughs> I, how did you feel? Give, just give me, like, general, like, feel, like, what was you rereading this, like, now? Like, because I'm assuming you were not gendered the last time that you read this before now. I... 
it was you did, you it was not it Detroit was, become gendered. The, <laughs> it was it was um a lot because I mm-hmm. realized like I did I did relate to a lot of her story, um, mm-hmm. but I thought my thing I like they they lost me when they said that she had a disorder, and I was like, oh, it's, fuck you, I like. Pink but shit. I'm normal. I like I like I like pink shit because I am. It is just hilarious that I, a dude, would be like so interested in. <laughs> You're a military bro. <laughs> yeah, You're a military bro. I was, and, and that's and that's like where it lost me. I wonder if like if if I, I wonder if if they had gone the extra mile and said fucking transgender, if I would have gotten it. But um. Mm. But it was nice, like going back and seeing, like, oh, I I was seen for a moment when I was young. Did want to give uh, before we moved on. Wanted to give a quick shout out to my first experience of seeing gendered characters, which is when I was like thirteen or fourteen. I recently did a write up about it, which I am vaguely plugging here because I'm annoying. But um, Nero O'Reilly, uh, the Carnivore Planet uh, webcomic. The, the, fu- the fucking times. demon erotica guy. Yeah, 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 him. Um, the his uh, he did a webcomic called Carnivore Planet from from like twenty ten to twenty fifteen ish. Um, that none of the characters in it are like explicitly trans, but like the, the, it is the first time I ever saw like somebody state their pronouns in any context. I think. Like, there's, like, a, the guy, it's, like, these guys who, like, it's, like, this group of, like, anarchist punks or whatever, and they kidnap, like, who they think is, like, a high prince of a corporation, uh, and when he gets in, he, like, introduces himself with his pronouns, and that, like, glossed right over my brain when I was two and read it the first time. <laughs> um, it's cool to go back. It's cool to go back and learn about this shit, because I found out about it. I I've had a, I, that's good. that's one of the, like the best experiences like going back yeah, 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 to yeah. to to something that you haven't seen in a while and like discovering how much of it is still with you mm-hmm. like I had that when I like re-listened to fucking Elton John Goodbye Yellow Brick Yellow Brick uh. Road uh the mm-hmm. first side of that album was on constant rotation when I was four uh and it is a majority of my compositional instincts today uh i to the point where like i gotta make a fucking cover of gray seal because that is to this day probably the most <laughs> patricia taxon song not written by patricia taxon uh yeah true i've still only heard uh don't shoot i'm just the piano player that's the only record i've heard from him <laughs> Uh, the one that and because it had crocodile rock on it uh, yeah that song uh uh, goodbye yellow brick road it has it has gray seal but it also has candle in the wind and Mm, and benny and the jets and love lies bleeding it's it's got a lot of stuff uh and it was nice discovering like the most of the chord changes that i fall back on are, are from that record and then I, I had that that same thing here when I read the Fujoshi chapter and realized, God, God fucking damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I've lived, yeah, I, yeah. I I lived that. I mean, it wasn't exactly the same, but it's is. There were a couple lines that speared through the heart, nonetheless. Uh, mm-hmm. It it's just has a really good understanding of like. That's... What it's like being a a teenager, and what it's like being in a state where you're final for f- like one of the first times that you're really able to process your emotions and shit. And it's like this really hard, arduous task, and it's something that you want to do a lot because it's... it's like, oh shit, I can process things. It's you know? it's it's the most caring and loving take on teenage angst that I've ever seen. <laughs> it cares about teenagers a lot. It yeah. really like takes it takes the concerns that they have very seriously. Okay, I want to talk about um, volume three before yeah, we let's fucking go. Let's go, let's go, go, let's go, run let's off go. into the sunset. Uh, yeah, we are fucking running with it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, God, where do I start? Um, I think the main thing that makes volume three really remarkable is the way that it reframes the entire series. In a way, it kind of, like... Because Picasso's never, like, this really um, 
like a, I, he's never like a particularly reliable or unreliable narrator. He's not really a driving force in the plot a lot of the time. He's just kind of being whisked along through this thing. They um, really do just fucking but, put like like the 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 character bio section. It says Jeon in parentheses yeah, yeah, okay. Yosuke <laughs> Hishida. It's like oh, like in case you forgot when you knew this character as Yosuke for like t- three pages. Fucker. It's, it's I, I, how fucker. Do... <laughs> Bitch. Um, that uh, that I attribute more to the translators. That has to be. Yeah. Fucking. That has to be some bullshit they did. Okay, sorry, but like, <laughs> <laughs> it is so fucked up. But um, the the way that the third volume kind of like. It, it kind of like pulls back and like like says wait no Picasso actually has been having a lot of control and sway over the narrative uh, and we're going to take that away from him now uh, and also kind of recontextualize the way that he's been negotiating the plot up to this point um, it, it, it's really interesting the thing that it does uh, and, it, and it does so in a way that could kind of be like if done poorly it kind of could have been like a like a big oh this is a big twist ending but it feels very natural for everything that came before it um feels like a natural escalation of that um so this final chapter is um P- P- picasso after solving um another issue for somebody who he had already solved a problem with before uh, Su- uh Sugiura, the first guy that he solved the problem. The guy who was who was about to is who was about to commit homicide. Uh, yeah, <laughs> for to to make his dad angry. Uh, t- <laughs> so he like so he solves another one of his problems. Um, but then Sugiura he um finds the page uh that Picasso drew that helped him uh help him through his problem. Um. And he gets really distressed by it. He's like, wait, how do you know about this? How do you know about this specific iconography that relates to it? You're stalking me. You're doing weird shit. Um, So he kind of unpacks, like, the way that Picasso is able to... They go over it, and Picasso tells him, like, very directly, like, how he's able to do this, the magical elements of the plot that have been happening. And he's like... And and, uh, Sugiura's like... I don't like that you did that. I think that it's bad that you did that. I think you're fucking weird and pushes away. So Picasso starts having a breakdown over that. Picasso is like, that, that I scene, don't really, yeah. That scene is, is fucking, because you don't actually see really that this is emotionally devastating to him until he's away at, yeah. by the river again. And he just fucking starts crying. Like Ugh. It's so harsh. He tries to, like, he sees, like, uh, one of the things is that, like, when he sees that there's somebody uh, who he is going to sketch, like, the inner mind of, he'll see, like, a, like a big kind of fireball thing around him a, a dark, that only he could a see. A dark aura. A dark aura. And it's like a, ske- um, it's like a sketchy aura as well, which is neat. Yeah. Right. So it's, like, the, around these, like, very pristine, um, kind of harshly inked manga characters. It's a very cool effect. Um, but... Uh, that'll happen and he'll like go over to them and then like hop into the sketchbook into the portal world with this in the final chapter the signifier that he um is having a mental breakdown uh and that he is going to kind of enter his own mind palace in this last chapter um is that like there's this really there's this aura that he perceives as being like intense bigger than any other aura that he's seen before but the reason it looks that big is because it's coming from him and surrounding his field of vision, and he can't identify it directly. Uh, and the pages of that happening are really, really fucking harsh because they keep getting more abstract and darker um, until and, he's whisked away into this completely and, fucking. And, yeah. and the the picture he draws for this this is where like they fucking Ugh. they they fucking weaponize the the Mario sixty four painting thing because. Mm-hmm. The, the picture he ends up drawing is completely inscrutable. It is just a watch mechanism. It's just fucking gears and shit. Um, it is completely impenetrable. It yeah, is completely and that, and that is like, interpret. that's like... And he's just like, what the fuck is this? That's like when you, that's like when you fucking see... It's the, it has the same emotional impact as when you see that the that the Earthbender prison in Avatar is, 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 is like they're, they're all kept on a big steel boat. 
Like it, it has that Ugh. same like that same sense of like hopelessness when you see something that does what not even you? have any iconography that you can really latch onto at all. And then and then the the darkness gets even more intense and he's being drowned in it and it's so good. It's, it's so good. And <sighs> yeah, it's yeah. And 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 also like the 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 other like twist is that the H H Hikari does not end up seeing that walk watch mechanism. He ends up in a place of complete blackness. Uh, so he's just kind of like, well, where the fuck is this? What do I do? Yeah, he's just kind of wandering. He's just kind of wandering around in there for a while, being like, what the fuck? I can't do anything. Uh, now, of course, this is all metaf a metaphor for uh, say it with me trauma, but. <laughs> What it, what it is, we're, is we're, it we're, fucking, we're fucking drama club bitches. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, it's so trashy. It's <laughs> it's so trashy, but so good and so heightened. It's like it goes back to the trauma of. Uh, <laughs> so like, like I said at the start, this is the the girl that he's friends with, um, in the first volume, who he loses in the accident, but then she comes back as an angel. She's also not there in the dark void, um, and. Part of what this final thing is processing is like, oh, oh, wait, I have horror. The reason that uh, this kid walking away and saying I'm gross and weird, even though I only had like a vague attachment and friendship to him, uh, is hitting me so hard is that I have um, some very intense abandonment issues because my fucking friend died next to me like three months ago. And I can't handle people not talking to me anymore. <laughs> um, so it's just it's so any and and it's like this thing that's very <laughs> obtuse to him because um, all of the elements that are that would be able to signify that this is the thing that he's very stressed about. Uh, this that this is the thing that he's like been burying deep inside of him. These are elements that are very surreal, but make up. Uh, the foundation of how the monster of the week format works. These are things that are not questioned throughout the entire series because they're part of the narrative and they're gen and they have to be generally accepted if you want to engage with the work in any meaningful capacity. But this chapter kind of pulls back and says, "Wait, these are also surrealist elements that you have to cope that you have to interrogate, you have to cope with." And it doesn't not make the magical elements like this story doesn't work yeah. at all. Uh, if you if 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 it was just in his head the whole time, these were still magical elements throughout up until this point. But it's something that's where he has to be confronted with, like your arm isn't fucking rotting off. You don't have a fairy. You can't. This is this is surreal. This is as surreal as anything else you're unpacking. Yeah. Well, we're we we are also experiencing uh, symbolic elements even outside of the mind palace. Uh, He's symbolic of something, especially since that. Especially since that is one of the arms that you use to make your yeah. art, which is the main way that you're able to express like, like yourself they... emotionally. It's like it's, uh... yeah. The, the way like the way that they just they break down the the boundary between the 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 art world and the real world, um, kind of like like the fucking pathologic at the end when, <laughs> um, when you discover that like it actually. This was all fiction, you fucker. Everything was was part of this, uh, this meditation on this one kid's uh, guilt and trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, and he f and he's and... involving himself in these other people's lives, uh, because he fe he feels a, a very intense emptiness inside himself, and he needs to like associate himself with other people more. And it's like so. Oh, fuck. It's like it's like it's like an invitation to. Mm -hmm. It's for it's like an invitation for us to exit the mind palace world and look at the manga itself and what happens in it as its own like work of art that we are solving. Uh, it's so great. Um, it's very blunt in a way, but it's blunt in a way where it's like it has a lot of moving parts and it doesn't like it's it, there's no detriment to it being blunt. It's just like this very big kind of grand gesture at the end. I because because it, it's a it is, it's it a is. it's a complicated idea. Uh, so I, I think the bluntness is justified, and that's the first time. That's the first time we see the two art styles on the same page, <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. like melding together. When his friends are finally reaching down to him to help mm. him up, 
and it's and it's like uh, it's they don't even necessarily help out, but like it just kind of it, but it leads into this really nice natural moment of him waking up surrounded by all of these people um, who aren't even necessarily really good friends with him, but really do want to engage with him, that really do want to like talk to him and be involved with him and shit. It's very sweet. It's so sweet. Um, it's so it makes it's me cute. cry. It's really every cute. time. Uh, it's it was a very truly like special moment for me getting to the end. Like it felt profound uh, to baby Avery. Um, yeah. And, and like uh, the other like small moment that I wanted to talk about just for a second is like when you finally do understand the significance of the watch mechanism, it's just, it's just, uh, Siguira just cut, like figuring out like the 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 clock of Picasso's heart had been stopped since Chiaki died and then we zoom in on the fucking clock and we see that the clock is actually the expansive wasteland surrounding the crime scene in his memory I I the imagery in this in this manga is so fucking intense it's 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 It'll. It stayed with me. Um, I really see how this left a big impact on you. Yeah. Um, uh, and one request for the anime adaptation that won't happen. Um, <laughs> it, it's probably for the best. Plant the fucking watch earlier. Just tell us about <laughs> the watch in the first chapter, and then don't mention it again. Like, please let us know about the fucking watch before that reveal mm -hmm. at the end, that his arm rotting was actually a, a watch that he had on. And mm -hmm. it was, like, symbolic, uh, or something. I think, that, like, I think there is something to be said for us not being able to see it at all until that last second. I think there is some weight to that, and I think there's some intent to that, but it probably, and, like, but... But in, in, the, in the same like, way, yeah. in the same way that the that the series like it allows you to forget that Chiaki is dead, mm -hmm. um, like it's it's very pushed to the side, and like and then we discover that that is actually a manifestation of something deeper. But yeah. I think I think something similar could be done with the watch, like that, like this thing that's there, but you're allowed to forget about it. Uh. Um, it, it, it could be very hokey and it wasn't, uh, and it's because it's just like well executed. It, th it thinks about people a lot. Uh, it cares about these people. It cares about um, its characters so much. It does. It does. Uh, yeah. Thank you for showing me this. Um, yeah. I'll probably try and look into this fucking guy more and see if he did other good shit. He might've. Uh, let's do a Google break, actually, because I want to check real quick. I'm going to get some more water. Have fun with your Google break. Big booty meets for you! <laughs> okay, apparently, uh, Usu, Usamaru Fuyura wrote um, the uh, manga that uh, Suicide Club was based off, which is the movie about, like, schoolgirls collectively throwing themselves in front of trains and shit. Um, that was directed by Sion Sono which I didn't know about. That makes sense, though, because that seems to, like, also be a thing that is very much cares about the mental health of, uh, like, high school students, though that one's, like, a lot less positive from what I could tell. <laughs> I haven't watched the movie or read the manga. Uh, but, yeah, I've heard very good things about Suicide Club, and I've watched uh, other movies by Sion Sono in the past. Uh, so that's really cool to find out. Uh, you want to talk about Nicholas I Collins? Think. Yes. Um, let me uh, let me pull up the track list for that so I can act, so I can visualize it in my head real quick. So the second thing that we're going to be talking about today is Nicholas Collins' 1992 LP. It was a dark and stormy night. Um, this is uh, something that is not like Gagaku Picasso because Gagaku Picasso is a book, uh, and it was a dark and stormy night is is a sound um <laughs> <laughs> genkaku picasso makes no noise unless you like turn the pages really hard or drop the book you could actually make several sounds with genkaku picasso um it's not it's actually none, none of which are 
uh, advertised. Check this out. Death of the Artist, I am making sound using Gengaku Picasso, which means it is an album. Um, Nicholas is, uh, it's very, it's a very close name to Nikolai. It is. Don't make me think about Nikolai right now. The album is a series of, uh, modern classical compositions, uh, that incorporate a lot of, uh, unique techniques in the way that their sound is generated. Um, the first three songs, which are all part of the Broken Light trilogy, make uh, heavy use of uh, skipping CDs. Uh, the fourth track uh, implements a fucking terrifying instrument that we could talk about a little bit on its own. Um, and the fifth song has, like, MIDI-generated percussion uh, from vocals and, like, he wrote an entire essay about the history of the reverse electric guitar I saw on his le on his website. Um, just a lot of very weird compositional things that I had not encountered uh, before I listened to it, and I listened to it at a fair at a relatively young age. So this is kind of like a young age art experience. This, this is another very episode. formative piece of media. Yes, this has, uh, this media, piece of media was very, very formative for Small Ricky. It was important for me. My my experience is. was listening to this, uh, being a bit tripped out by the by the first three tracks. Uh, sounds like a very foreboding uh, piece. Like it sounds like the storm is approaching, both the storm and the night. It's uh, like you know, you know, fucking um. You remember Mystery Guitar Man on YouTube? Yes. Uh, his, yeah. <laughs> the the first video that he did that got really popular was Guitar Impossible, which was him playing the Marriage of Figaro, uh, with a guitar, but cutting so each note like using editing software to cut from one note to the next so it sounds really weird but also he put no crossfades in between the notes so there is this um serendipitous percussion section in in this in this youtube video and that's that's what I remember uh, that that's one. that's what broken light is making use of there is a serendipitous yeah. percussion section born from skipping cd's That kind of field of gimmick YouTube videos that were popular for a while, like Mystery Guitar Man or shit like, or even God forbid, Smooth McGroove. Um, those kind of videos um, are really mostly interested in the formal qualities of what's being produced. And for a lot of kids, uh, me included, uh, that was the first time that uh, they ever really thought about the way that music was produced because guitar doesn't usually sound like it does in that one mystery guitar man video. There's not usually that strong percussive element. So like to, to, to really properly approach the video, you have to consider like the way that video, the way that video editing works, uh, the way that guitars typically work and why it doesn't sound like that. You the, know? The, a, the lore did eventually expand to suggest that, Joe Penna does have a superpower to play with jump cuts in real life. Uh, <laughs> there, there's a video of <laughs> Shane Dawson getting really mad at him for playing like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I found uh, Shane Dawson. And then I looked at his content uh, and he, he, I just saw that video where he cuts a woman's tongue off. Um, mm -hmm. And it, I still think about it. Um, mm -hmm. it's my big, my big, my big <laughs> spongy brain just soaked it all up, sucked it down, said, mmm, content, great. And it's still in there somewhere, yep. still kicking around. Not sure where it is, though. One, one day, uh, one day, will humanity will be forced to reconcile with the, the people that were made by this, like that particular era of the internet. That Shane that... Dawson specifically is so. His content is so much more egregious than it really has, like, like anyone else who was doing shit like that. Most people who were doing shit like them weren't that egregious. Like, him specifically, though, it's like, ugh, God. But 
uh, what differentiates Broken Light um, on It Was a Dark and Stormy Night, the 1992 album by Nicholas Collins, uh, from that Mystery Guitar Man piece, um, is, uh, one, uh, the CD player uh, is a live component. It's something that Nicholas was uh, actively altering uh, while uh, the string quartet, string quartet that he got to play on top of it uh, was uh, recording. The string, so, string, the string quartet. String quartet, fuck you. Uh, the... <laughs> So it'll be like the CD player and he has like these very specific, like there was these passages where there's a pre-existing musical piece that he'll play sped up at four times speed and then make it skip over and over and over again at different intervals. And uh, the uh, quartet will be playing either in response to the CD playing up or playing over top of it. I'm, I'm probably like, since this is a lesser known album, I've probably faded in like a little excerpt of the audio in the background for this part so you could understand what I'm talking about with this. <laughs> The opening bit with the CD playing really fast, like the call and response between the the extra speed string music and the 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 guy is just going buck wild, like is so was such a striking way to open the album. And then and then the the guy the the guy in the in the title track imitates that noise with his mouth uh, before the album closes. <laughs> I've listened to other pieces uh, that have used uh, skipping CD players uh, for musical effect. Uh, there's that one. Um, <sighs> fuck uh, the Mel the uh, Symphony for Wounded CD that was on Tizadik. Um, that's not how you pronounce the label's name. What was that one? That what was that one album where the guy like took like like two two vinyl records that were broken and then fused together and then played like as, as a single record so it's like was constantly switching i can find the list that was on on rate your music <laughs> did you find the list on discogs too that was like weird formats for records or some shit i, I found i found uh, a list on rate your music that is just a uh a a sort of compendium of things themed around broken formatting. Uh, I think it was the same guy who had that top tier drone list where I found ELEH. But yeah, there are several lists that are around that are like based around uh, specific formatting. Uh, and I found those. I'm not sure if I found this CD. Uh, it was a dark and stormy night through those lists, but I did um, find uh, a lot of the things that were adjacent to it. I think this was recommended by a friend on an old message board, um, this specific recording. I'm going to find um, this Rate Your Music user. It almost yeah. justifies the existence of the site. Um, almost. It doesn't, but it comes close. The lists on Rate Your Music are very good. Thank you to the people who make those. Rate Your Music added a very cool thing recently where it shows you, you can click a button and it shows you the individual credits track by track for an album, which is nice for this one specifically. It is, it is, uh, Lamuya, L-A-M-U-Y-A, -A, and apologies, it is she. Mm. Oh, um, gotcha. Sorry. The list is called Degraded, Distorted, Damaged, Destroyed, um, and the album was... Milan, and it's called Broken Music from 1979. Uh, that that is the one where the where the dude uh, glued pieces of a vinyl together and it made interesting sounds. Uh, so that is where this tangent went. That <laughs> the Broken Light trilogy is is uh, the only time I've ever heard a CD player used as like a percussive element with things layered on top of it still though it's to really incredible effect uh it never gets boring throughout um the, the like the entire like three track run of it which totals out to 15 minutes of the record uh did you have anything else to say about that one yeah not, not really i wanted to talk about <laughs> the the horrifying trombone thing the the the, the fourth track tobabo fonio uh, great name well on the on, on the surface it is a series of very p 
piercing uh dynamic tones that that surround you and go everywhere uh, and as the track goes on they slowly reveal themselves to be uh assembled from uh samples of, of pre-existing like marching band material that are being played at rapid fire but yeah it, it's like granular synthesis they they sort of mm-hmm. pull the curtain back by slowing down the the fire rate of this gun and re- like reveal it to be a, a selection of very choppy like samples of horn players and stuff so all of that is being triggered live by midi which is interesting in itself because at the time this was recorded, that was very uncommon. Um, by the time you get to like early 2000s, when like Editions Magoo laptop uh, glitch material is a lot more prominent, that's something that's like fairly commonplace. It's like rapid fire MIDI controlled electronics. But for the time this was recorded and composed, it's like that in itself is like a really remarkable uh, component to this beast to, to b- base an entire work around. Uh, like MIDI controlled and MIDI triggered electronics like that. The thing that about this track specifically and more uh, specifically the instrument that it is made out of, there's a reason why the drones on this track sound so dynamic. And it's because the MIDI controller for this track is uh, being, is one of the most fucking ridiculous things I've ever seen. (laughs) So... There are videos of this available online. I'll link one in the description. It's based around um, this junk trombone that he uh, like he just found in a box in his garage. And he was like, I need like a hub for this MIDI controller that I'm making. And he just looked at the trombone and was like, yeah, that'll work. So in effect, what it is, is like there is a sp- the, the um, I don't know trombone terminology. There is a, there is a, a MIDI keyboard thing like a like a series of buttons that is built into like the slider thing on the trombone the, the, the fucking can... the 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 yeah yeah that <laughs> thing. Uh, where you put your hand rest to control the length and uh tone of the trombone there's like a midi keypad built into there where he can press buttons and switch buttons around and press buttons rapid fire to trigger uh a different series of samples from the midi board um, that will fire out like different, like different things that have been pre-recorded, and um, the and the speaker, um, the way that sound is actually emitted from this thing is built into the horn of the instrument. So like he will be controlling the MIDI, and I think it's also like there's something about like the length of the sample being controlled by how far or how shallow. Uh, the trombone arm is being extended so he will be controlling that with one hand and he will be holding the horn with the other hand and from the horn will be coming the sound from the trombone which he can then move easily use to like walk around the recording space he puts mutes over it at different points in the recording so this thing that is like this really raw like harsh uh midi triggered electronic section is being muted uh using a mute for like a horn instrument which gives it this like really visceral, um, like organic quality to this thing that's usually uh, like this very mechanical sound. It's insane. If if any of y'all at home uh, want to read the supplementary material to, to see if you if you wanna if you wanna decipher it, um, it is available for free along with the track list on this on this madman's website. Yeah, Nicholas. Like, I'll link the. I'll link his website in the description. As well. he's getting a lot of links today, but this fucking guy, he released this album on like a label ass label in '92, and now you could just like download a bootleg copy of it from his official website with the full waveforms and all of the essays associated with the record, um, as well as a and, uh, a text transcription of the title track, which is important. Yeah, this record is not good because it is produced in an interesting way. It is produced in a very interesting way. Every track on here is, makes really weird, and fucking wild use of uh, the record of like available recording technologies. Uh, but the reason that's good is because it sounds good uh, and is very pretty um, and is very intuitive. Like, it's not a record that's interesting strictly for like academic purposes. The first four tracks you could put those on and listen to them as like, especially the Broken Light trilogy. Those are like. Those could be in circulation with, like, 
the fucking William Basinski, Brian Eno ambient study mixes or whatever. Those are gorgeous pieces on their I, own. I think right? I think they're a bit too busy for those. But like like a bit uh, too busy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, f- they had, fin- yeah. Uh, finesse fuckers will will dig it. Yeah, if you're a finesse fucker, if you're in an adi- if you're an edition Magoo uh, ho as I as I am myself, uh, you will get a lot out of this. Like, LP. like just, just if you get down with some Mika Vanio. Really though, if I could request one thing that you do after watching this episode, or just turn the episode off honestly and go watch this for a while, is like please watch the performances of Tabano Fonio that are up on YouTube. They are fucking insane watching this thing move around in space and create these fucking nightmare noises so easily. Ah, oh, God, it's really, really gorgeous. It's a really, really gorgeous instrument. Um, unfortunately, uh, at the end of his essay about uh, the instrument, which he refers to as trombone-propelled electronics, uh, he talks about how the instrument was uh, tragically run over by a car uh, en route to a, like a performance at like a Belgian radio show, and it worked for a couple months after that and then died miraculously the night before a performance uh, and was never oh, able to work again. Oh, justice for the... For the trombone nightmare machine, it, it's tragic. I need it, she. She's beautiful. I wish she was. <laughs> we need to heal her. We need to fix her. Um, so you could talk about the last track a little bit if you want. Okay. Uh, I want to hear about what you think. I want to talk about how you would describe the last track before okay. I get into it. It was a dark and stormy night. Is the title track of it was a dark and stormy night, the 90, 1992 album by Nicholas Collins. Um, it takes up more than half the album. Yeah, you and your nose will not fit here. Um, <laughs> there, it is ostensibly a like a very playful excursion into MIDI as triggered by voice. With like it does a lot of interesting compositional things with like resonant drones coming from this dude's voice as he recites various essays, um, and also like instruments and percussion being triggered, going with the rhythm of it. No one, of course, believed him at first. An examination of the painting revealed that it was clearly by the same hand as the supper at a mouse, the museum or Monsi a painting from the same period of Vermeer's work. Painted well accepted and authenticated by no less a personage than the great Dutch art historian Bredius. I initially found this piece to be really frustrating um, because you cannot hear the dude. Um, it's impossible. He's he's in, he's completely inscrutable as as soon as like the the. But but like sometimes a little bit of it will poke through. Like when he says fucking no one believed him and the fucking Tycho drums just <laughs> just fuck you up. Uh, like there are there are like very profound musical moments that are born from this dude this dude's speech. Um the guy has a very dynamic voice, uh with a lot of very delightful inflections and 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 like there are enough moments where it pokes above the haze, and also enough like lamp shading where you know you're not really supposed to be able to understand him because there is one part where the voice drops out, and the only way to know where, where he like what he was saying there is to read the the transcript, and to follow along with the percussion that was being triggered by the voice that was cut out of the final recording. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> it it is. It is like the kind of thing that 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 I think would be like a parody of fucking conceptual art, but also it is so lit, especially after yeah. you like you take the time to read the essays that he's sampling from. Um, basically, the conceit is that it's a, a sort of a nesting structure. He, he opens by saying it was a dark and stormy night. We were huddled around a fire. I turned to Mary and asked her to tell a story, and she said it was a dark and stormy night. But that continu- that that goes on for a while, but then he starts uh, asking for stories from uh, essayists who <laughs> who he's sampled from, and they tell excerpts. So, like the first one is like he addresses Susan Talman, who he stole the first text from for this, um, and he says, "Susan, tell us a story," and it goes into this excerpt of an essay. 
that she wrote about like somebody who was like uh forging art from a from like a renaissance period artist and how he considered himself a national hero uh for forging these works uh and selling them on the market and shit like that bless you all of them are heavily focused on authorship um and distribution of art and the interpretation of art uh and the transformation of artistic ideas i honestly didn't have as much of a difficulty parsing uh what he was saying this time it's probably because i've listened to um this track a couple times before uh and have also read the text on its own before reading the thing which probably would help to understand like what's actually being said throughout um it would probably except for the part where they drop his voice out that i think that i think that part is gonna yeah (laughs) It seems like this thing where the the voice is being treated more so as a generative thing. Um, and by extension of that, um, the percussion that is being triggered by the speaker's voice using the MIDI system is an interpretation of what he's saying and all of uh, all of the instrumentation that is going along with the percussive elements is an interpretation of the percussive elements interpretation of the text and so on and so forth. The album is using the text in a very different way than the downloadable PDF is using it. Like, Definitely. like the, the text... That's more of a score. It has, That's more of a score for it. Yeah, it's a score. It is the input into this mm-hmm. piece. It is, it is yeah. the MIDI. <laughs> My favorite essay is the one about, like, imagining a museum that, that uh, shows, like, Latin artifacts. Um... And one would like imagine like this dusty book that must be maintained and and kept in good order, but this would require an apparatus that would make it difficult to read. So there would have to be a transcript next to it, next to it, and a translation next to that. Uh, and and to the point where the supplementary material becomes almost more of a significant experience than the thing itself. So what is the value of keeping the the object, the historical object, present in the room with us? What thanks 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 for saying that and <laughs> thanks for seeing me and and then and then of course the the significance of that then being repurposed in the actual piece that you're listening to as simply the generative uh like source information because it could have been anything but it might as well be something with like symbolic significance to the piece itself God, I, I think a lot of the concepts that this track specifically ta- taps into aren't things that are going to be necessarily unfamiliar to uh, people who have looked into this stuff specifically. Like for me, as like a 13 or 14 year old listening to this, uh, this was the first time I was really forced to think very intensely about a lot of the concepts that I presented. And that was very, uh, like, that was just kind of like, oh, shit, oh, shit, I'm, I'm being owned, I'm getting owned, I'm getting, like, wow. Getting I'm owned getting... online. Yeah, this is, like, I think this is, like, the closest that I had to, like, reading House of Leaves when I was, like, w- when kids were, like, 13 and realizing, wow, there's, like, context for art. That's so fucked up. Uh, but uh, I, I think there's still definitely a lot of value to it now because the excerpts that are being drawn from, the way that they're being arranged, the way that they're being utilized, it doesn't feel like tacky. It it feels like these are questions that are maybe uh, familiar to me now, but they're things that I still really don't have decent answers for. Talking um, about and, yeah. talking about uh, it was a dark and stormy night purely from the point of view of the source text feels like it would be a bit a bit of the same misstep as talking about house of leaves but it's only the story about that guy who discovered his house is a bit too big on the inside and not yeah, yeah, like yeah. the multiple layers of framing device bullshit surrounding it because it's not it's it's, it's that story being that's it, it's, that story is in a found footage movie that exists within the universe but doesn't actually it's this old guy writing about a movie that doesn't exist uh, but also it's a se- but but also it's not that that old guy it's a separate like it's a, it's another dude twink. it's this other mm-hmm. like fucking i and he's writing about and he's making up the whole thing to process his <laughs> say it with me trauma so um but it's it is similar to house of leaves in the way that all this academic bullshit 
it's in service of some form of aesthetic. Like there is like, even within like the framing devices themselves, there's a rhythmic quality to them. The nesting uh, element of the text is like this rhythmic thing real where you're, you're kind of anticipating when the end of a text is coming because of like the very regular lengths that a lot of these are. Uh, and when a text isn't as long as any of the other ones, it's very shocking. Like uh, the uh, quotation from Jasper Johns after uh, the, uh, series of passages about blues music that comes in and it's this very brief passage of uh, him saying take an object do something else to it do something else to it do something else to it and each time that repeats there's a separate wham on the electric guitar it's fucking like ah, it's so metal ah. and then <laughs> and then, and then even that lamp shades itself when, when when at the end it's like oh well we, i've heard that one before jasper i don't care about that tell me a story dorothy <laughs> <laughs> It's like um, all of the um, little excerpts that are inserted into it are very interesting in its own right. I kind of glanced past the first one, but I was kind of shocked when I re-listened to it this time. Um, it goes into like how um, most of the text is going into how like most of the best art dealers in Europe couldn't recognize the forgeries. They all looked like genuine Ramirez. Uh, and everyone thought that they were genuine Ramirez. And at the end of the text, it's just like, the thing that's strange is that all of the paintings that were forged were rather ugly and don't look much at all like what people think of when they think of Ramirez. And that's like, what, what the, what, what the fuck's, what, 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 what's Ramirez then? Wait, no. <laughs> it's so fucked up. It's I, really fun. It's I really feel cute. like someone, probably it's going to be me, has to make a fucking <laughs> like lyric video for this. I track. thought about that while I was talking about this. Like, I kind of want to. Um... I like the way that you do text. Actually, you should do it. It would be okay. Cute. <laughs> uh, hi, Nicholas Collins. I don't know how online you are. Uh, please email one of us, and uh, and we we, we want to know if we could get like formal permission to do like a lyric video for your thing because uh, I like it a lot. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll probably do it anyway uh, so that we could make a new secondhand idea. Uh, but it would be cool if we got your permission uh, and we like the album that you made a lot. Uh, yeah. Like yeah, it was it was really it was neat. <laughs> really cool. Uh, it demonstrates a stunning ambition and and radical thought. Did want to draw uh, before we came to a close. Definitely listen to uh, It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. Uh, if you are big into like I guess just music production in general, but also just like alternative systems for generating music and like formal ways, weird formal shit with generating music. That's also very I, fun to listen to. I think to. like like any interest in like uh, interesting modern classical would would, would be a, a good a good signal to take the go ahead because this this is operating on the same level. Just because there were a lot of guys. It reminded me like like Steve Reich has some some tracks where he's where he's using um digital not digital but like recordings of of shit like what's what's that one it's the one that's on the CD with electric counterpoint but isn't electric counterpoint different trains yes it's for fans of underrated Steve Reich uh piece different trains because what was appealing to about me about this when I was very when I was very young outside of just like a lot of the textual stuff that it played with and I was kind of unfamiliar with at the time was just that it sounded really good uh, and that it was some of the first like very formal uh, kind of big big brain academic bullshit music that I listened to that was really fun uh, and inviting and pleasant to listen to and really invited uh, you to interrogate like the mechanisms by how it was made in the same way that that at the end of Genkaku Picasso, it is revealed that there too exists symbolic uh, interpretational elements in what has been to this point treated as the real world. Uh... <laughs> we got it. We got, we got it. it. That's the episode. We we, that's that's the episode. We that's found. It. We, we found the. It. We found the. We we brought it back. Mm -hmm. We did it. Okay, I feel fucking great about that. Actually, go listen to it. It was a dark, sto dark and stormy night. Uh, or order a order a copy of Ginkaku Picasso so you can jump scare yourself with the with the watch mechanism. Yeah, uh, find out. Uh, I guess spoiler. <laughs> this episode <laughs> contains spoilers for Ginkaku Picasso. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for watching. 
uh, this episode. Um, we have uh, a semi big one coming up, and in retaliation for a making her first uh consume a hundred hours of her life uh and then um mentally scarring her for the rest of her life uh avery is uh making me do another long form thing in return of a comparable scope to echo so uh that's probably going to be coming out that's probably not going to be i think that shouldn't be the next one that comes out because we still have a lot more to go through and i want to give myself time to look through like the supplementary material more so with that and re-listen to stuff when that i think i need to but that's going to be coming up. So there's going to be another big one coming up in a while. Um, thanks for continuing to watch this. Um, yeah, people... we, we, we got some dudes. Um, yeah. Shout yeah, outs to we... shout outs to um, Lawyer Dog. Shout outs Lawyer Dog. Every time you draw TJ, you give him really big thighs. Um, and that's correct because he does have big thighs because he runs a lot. I think that if we keep getting like over 500 views for episode i'm probably actually going to have to buy a microphone at some point which is unfortunate <laughs> but we'll see. i i, we'll I see. have i have the youtuber mic <laughs> it's it's shameful i have i have the the, the sure sm7b <sighs> i'm just gonna get a blue yeti um if you would like to buy the blue yeti is a 100 stainless steel toy <laughs>